All right. Well, uh, if you've ever created any kind of a vision board, have any? Of, you don't have to raise your hand, but have you ever created maybe a vision board for your future? You know, where you take out maybe pictures from magazines and you put them on a big poster board and say, "That's what I want in life." Or maybe if you've ever kind of dreamed about like what your bucket list is, you know, what, you're, what you want to accomplish before you kick the bucket, that whole kind of modern philosophy around thinking about a vision for your future. Or maybe you've dreamed about if I win the lotto or if I have a long lost relative that leaves me millions and millions of dollars, what would I do with that? Like, would you buy a fleet of cars? Would you buy a private island? Maybe hire a, a, you know, somebody, some kind of uh, you know, chef that can cook you some of the most delightful of foods. Uh, maybe you would buy a sports team and, and be like, oh man, wouldn't you at that point say, I'm living the good life. Like that's an incredible vision. And you say, wouldn't it be great to have like all of these things at your fingertips and say, I'm really living the good life. Have you ever asked the question, What is the good life? Honestly, what is, when you think about what are you shooting for in life? I mean, think about when we're growing up, we're, you know, you're taught in school about the U.S. Constitution. I mean, it's in the DNA of what it means to be an American to say we are endowed by our creator to pursue a life of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Like it's in our DNA to dream about the good life. Have you ever thought about what that is for you? What are you aiming for? Or better yet, what does Jesus say about the good life? Well, it's funny you should ask. (laughs) Because he preached the greatest sermon ever preached. And there's a debate, was it one sermon or was it a collection of his sermons? But it's 100 verses, roughly, and we're going to spend the next 10 weeks looking at this phenomenal sermon. I mean, it's life-changing, and it, to the point to the name of the series, it will, if you're teachable throughout this, it will redefine a lot of how you see this world. In fact, to get into the idea of redefinition, Jesus started this very sermon preaching about the good life. Did you know that? He talks heavily right out of the gate about the good life. And so we're going to see his definition of it today. Let me dive into it. It's in Matthew 5. So for the next 10 weeks, we're going to hang out in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. In fact, I would encourage you, make this a habit for the next 10 weeks. Several times throughout the week, I would invite you to read this sermon over and over and over and over again. It will get in your soul. And it will redefine a lot of how you see this world. Let me start at the beginning of the sermon and how it starts to set up. Matthew 5, 1 says it this way. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, so he's starting to get a lot of popularity and the crowds are coming. He went up to the mountainside or up on the mountainside. And in Israel this day, you can actually see this mountainside. And he sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. This is very important to understand the audience to whom Jesus is preaching to. Who is his audience? The disciples. Now, the crowd that gathers around are people from all walks of life. There will be people who are poor in the crowd, people who are destitute, People who are probably middle class, who have a good job and some stability in their family structure. There will probably be some religious leaders in the crowd. But this is the early days of Jesus' ministry, so there wasn't a lot of fanfare from a religious standpoint yet. He was just one among many of the preachers that would preach along the countryside. But this day, a crowd of people gathered, and he pulled his disciples together 
And if, if you have ever been to the Sea of Galilee, it's quite awesome because it is a natural amphitheater. So you can see him up on this mountainside, on the cliffside, and you would have the crowd down around here. The echo would be loud. So the people would very much be able to hear what he has to say. But it's very important to realize the next 10 weeks are written to us from Jesus and preached to us from Jesus for those who are all in. Those who say, I want to follow no matter what the cost. What we're about to get into is not for the faint of heart. This is not fluff in any way, shape, or form. This is the heart of God in so many ways. And I'm so excited to dive into it with you. But I want to make sure that you're aware. This is, this is something that is going to be somewhat, got to buckle up your seatbelt from time to time and say, am I ready to actually go where he's taken us? And so, as I said, Jesus started talking about the good life. What do I mean by that? Well, he says nine different times he talks about blessed are you. But we didn't want to just talk about it as blessed are you. This is kind of like hashtag blessed, you know. We've kind of ruined the word blessed, haven't we, in Christianity? Like I, when, when you say bless you, I'm like, are you putting me down? Like blessed to me doesn't really seem, you know, because when I come out of, when I was studying uh, in, in education seasons, um, in Kentucky, when they say, bless your heart, it means you're a fool. That's what I was taught and kind of trained. So blessed is quite confusing. And, oh, she's just blessed. He's just blessed. Well, the word blessed there that Jesus uses nine different times to talk about eight different categories, literally, he's saying this very clearly, flourishing are you, fulfilled are you complete are you that's the word that he's using or to put it in what we're talking about here you'll you'll be living the good life if you have these nine different things and really eight categories in other words he lays out for us what it looks like to be a citizen of heaven to know that you know that you're a child of god and so he lays out very clearly, this is what it means to be living the good life. And I just want to compare it to maybe what we think of the good life here in America as we go. So I'm going to look at the first one. I'm going to work through several of them, and then we'll look through the rest of them next week. Here's the first one. Jesus says, and think of it, these aren't like eight or nine different people this is like Jesus is describing one person living the good life, having these eight or nine different characteristics. The first one is this. Jesus said, the good life belongs to the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What a terrible way to begin a sermon. And the word poor is very frustrating for us as Americans because we think financial poor. He's not talking about money at all. He's talking about literally poor in spirit. Like you don't have what it takes. That goes against everything that we're taught, even in Christianity, frankly. Because we're taught, you do have what it takes. Go get them, tiger. And so we are coached. I am coached and I coach you to say... Pull yourself up from your bootstraps and fight another day. Let's go out there and get them because we have what it takes. And Jesus says, ah, no, 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 no. I want to redefine that for you. Blessed are you. You are living the good life when you're actually poor in spirit. What in the world does that mean? He's saying self-help is an oxymoron. The self cannot truly help itself is what Jesus is saying. And he says, until you get that, you're not going to understand Christianity. Until you admit, I need help. I can't fix this. He's making it very, very, very clear. You won't be living the good life. See, we're, we're born and bred into a world that says, you know, if you, if you um, study hard, if you have the right family system, you marry well, you get a good education, you're going to be able to learn enough life hacks to make life manageable. 
you can do it. You can fix it. You, you can manage through life. And Jesus is saying, until you realize that life isn't manageable and there will be times that you just are in over your head, those are the moments when you're really living the good life because those are the moments when you actually get to see the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because Jesus is saying, that's when I can finally take the lordship of your life and lead you where I wanna take you. This is step one of Christianity. It's interesting to me, AA actually gets this very right. If you've ever heard of the 12 steps, I have many friends who, uh, I, I love it when they say, uh, Ken, I, I'm an alcoholic, uh, you know, I, but I, I, I haven't had a drink for 25 years, but I still know step one. I am powerless to alcohol. You put me around it, that thing owns me. And uh, where does AA get that philosophy? From Jesus' teaching right here. You are living the good life. You are blessed. You are fulfilled. Your life is complete when you realize my spirit is poor and it needs to be rescued. I'm in need of a savior. That's the good life. Talk about redefining how we live. Because I usually think the good life is when I can, I can fix it. And Jesus says, ah, you're doing it the opposite way. Pretty in your face, right out of the gate. He goes to the second one. So you can picture Jesus kind of panning out throughout the crowd and he continues on. The good life belongs to those who mourn for they will be comforted. He's, Jesus doesn't know how to preach. You don't work the crowd by saying all of these crazy things. You don't start a sermon by saying, your life is going to be better when you suffer. You don't start like, what is Jesus doing here? What is he saying? I mean, how is it possible that mourning, weeping, is actually really living? What? This doesn't make sense. Jesus is saying, when you mourn, when you cry, when you weep, you're actually fully alive. It doesn't make sense. Well, the answer is because of what comes because of that mourning. What did it say? Blessed are those who mourn for what? They will be comforted. I just heard it. They will be comforted. You know what that is? It's Jesus saying to us right out of the gate, to the very beginning of his sermon, he's saying, I want intimacy with you. Now, what I'm about to say is going to sound really not good. But if I had a chance to do a wedding or a funeral, 100 times out of 100, I would choose the funeral. Now, I've, I've officiated over many of your weddings. I have like seven or eight in a row coming up real soon. And I had one yesterday and it was great. And I was filled and it was like, I love it. But if I had to choose between a wedding and a funeral, I would always choose the funeral. Why? Because C.S. Lewis got it right. He said, God whispers in our pleasure, but he shouts in our pain. And I have felt that personally. Every time I have gone through the valley of the shadow of death, I have felt an intimacy with God. There is nothing like it on planet earth. And frankly, there is nothing the world has to offer as fulfilling as when you know you've been held by your God. Jesus is really defining what life, what really makes sense in life. And until you have allowed God to first fill your poor spirit and secondly then to hold you, you've not experienced the beauty of what it means to be human. Oh yeah, we can buy a lot of stuff and we can really go after big visions for how to build your life up, but it will never, never satisfy. And that's what Jesus is saying right out of the gate. Jesus is saying life is not found in the mountaintops, it's found in the valley. He's saying it's in these moments where I will wipe every tear from your eyes and I will listen to you and I will intimately care for you. God shouts in our weeping. 
That's where Jesus says, the good life is for those who mourn, for they will experience my comfort. I imagine at this this point, Jesus, uh, uh, the crowd is like, did I hear that correctly? Like, I have no idea where you're going with this, Jesus. Jesus continues his sermon and he says again, the next one, the good life continues, everybody. It's not only for the poor in spirit, not only for those who mourn, but the, the good life belongs to the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Here, Jesus seems to really go off his rocker, frankly, because if, if I, I've studied history, I know how human nature works. I know how people work. But in our culture and in every culture in human history, no matter where you go on planet Earth, at any century, you pick it and I will show you that the aggressive always come out on top. The meek get stepped on. They get trampled over, they get pushed aside, they get taken advantage of. How can Jesus truly say the good life are for those who are meek? Well, because of the reward he talks about here. This would be a great life group assignment for you. I would challenge you this week in your life group to actually look at all of the rewards based on the blessed statements of the good life. And this one is an interesting reward because it's a reward about the future. We've talked about this as we did a study on Revelation a few years ago and as we we did some different teachings on Revelation and end times, we've done some eschatology end times stuff and um, all those sermons have come to one conclusion. Jesus is what we said last week for Easter. Jesus is making all things new, not all new things. Jesus is in the business of resurrection. When we see the new Jerusalem coming out of heaven, we see the new Jerusalem coming to the recreated earth, the renewed earth, the resurrected earth. Like literally, God is saying, the meek will inherit that. You want to talk about a good long-term investment? I mean, I talk to people that are financial advisors all the time and they say, this is a good 20-year investment. I'm like, I've got an eternal investment. Like, this is an incredible ROI, you know? I mean, you want to get a good return on your investment. Come on! Jesus is laying it out clearly. If you walk in meekness, you will have the good life for all eternity because you'll inherit the earth. Your inheritance is significant. You want to talk about a major inheritance when people say, yeah, my dad left me, you know, $400,000. I'm like, my dad left me the whole earth. Like, that's what he's saying here. This is an incredible, the good life is a tremendous future. But it's for the meek. And you may say, oh, nuts. I'm not meek at all. Like everything I step on, like everywhere I step, it's like I'm, I'm too bold. And I'm too opinionated. And my personality is, if you're an Enneagram person, I'm an eight. And, or I'm an ape, you know, and I kind of like, I bully my way through. How... I'm not meek. Well, we got to get an understanding of the definition of what meek means. Meekness does not mean weakness. You know what meekness means? Meekness means strength under control. A meek person can listen to people who they disagree with and can handle their anger and their disagreement And they can handle their strength in a way that is under the control and lordship of Christ. Why? Because first, they did the first thing of what it means to be under the the lordship of Christ. They are poor in spirit. So I've realized I can't fix myself. Jesus becomes the Lord of my life. And then he can take all the strength within me and he can channel it in a healthy way. Strong, bold people can very much be meek. They can learn how to listen. They can learn how to be patient with people. They can learn how to coach people and care for people. Like meekness is a phenomenal trait. And so Jesus says, the good life belongs to the meek for they will inherit the earth. What an incredible word. And then he goes on and I mean, he lays it out so clearly and he goes to the next good life. And he says this, and I can imagine, you can almost picture the tension in the crowd You know, uh, it's incredible here. And Jesus says next, 
The good life belongs to those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Hunger and thirst. When was the last time you were hungry? Maybe this morning. I mean, it's, maybe you have a fast metabolism. When was the last time you were thirsty? You know, those times you're like, I am so thirsty. I'm going to die if I don't drink something. You finally drink something. You're like, oh, like when you're hungry or thirsty, you crave deeply anything to satisfy because you're just, you're, you're going to lose it. And that's why our mission program, as we outreach at Cornerstone, the first thing we do is dig water wells for a community in, in Kenya, for example. Because we know if we give them a glass of water, they will listen to what we have to say. But we don't go in there and just say, hey, Jesus is Lord. You better, you better follow us and what we're saying. They won't hear a word we say. But if we quench their thirst, they start to say, we can trust you because you met our basic needs. And Jesus here is saying, if you're hungry or thirsting for righteousness... Then you'll be filled. What, what does he mean by that? Well, let's first define righteousness. I think a lot of us could probably, if you've ever studied any Christianity and what righteousness, you've probably heard the definition. Righteousness means set apart for right living. Right living. Like I live the straight and narrow life. That is righteous. And that's true. But there's a deeper component to righteousness. And it's this concept. Righteousness means I've been approved. Have you ever applied for a job somewhere? Or maybe you applied to a school. You remember when you got that letter? Like I remember when I was applying to different schools and, and, and I'd get the letter that says, you've been accepted. And you feel like you've been approved. You're like, amazing. Or when you get that job and you say, whoa, I can't believe they accepted me. And you just feel on cloud nine. Or maybe that person you asked out on a date and then they pause and you wait to hear, will, will they accept me? Will they be approving of my request to date? And if they say yes, elation, because you've been approved, you've been accepted. Isn't that a great feeling? I mean, that's a basic human need. I want to be accepted. And what Jesus is saying is when you come under my righteousness, like you hunger and thirst for a connection with me, intimacy with me. You'll be approved be, before almighty God. Like that is an incredible gift. God says the good life or for those who long for that kind of approval, right living, covering, being covered by God's righteousness. It's an incredible gift. What does he say is the reward for that? You will be filled this is talking about being filled with the Holy Spirit. There is a difference between a person who is filled by the Holy Spirit and a person who is filled by their own desires. We've talked about this many times before. It's like the flesh versus the spirit. When you're filled with your flesh, you get all of the things of earth and you, whatever I can do to try to satisfy but when you're filled with the Spirit, oh, you see and feel thoughts and, and ideas of God and you see people differently. The world is different when you're filled with his righteousness. Jesus then scans the crowd and I'm sure at this point it's interesting. He shifts now from the internal for a moment to the external. His very next statement. The good life belongs to the merciful for they will be shown Mercy. Interesting. The good life belongs to the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Now, we look at this one, and I, I bet a lot of us would say, hey, I think we're kind of getting this one. You know, because the eye for an eye mantra of the ancient Near Eastern cultures gone. Like, you hurt me, I'm going to hurt you back. And I know sometimes we have that desire, but we have a justice system that really is based on some of this starting with a, a concept of mercy. So we may look at that and say, how is this Jesus kind of redefining everything? It makes sense. You show mercy, you should receive mercy. This one doesn't seem too out there like the other ones did. Well, here's the interesting thing. We've had 2,000 years to be hearing this teaching of Jesus. In that day and age, first century, this was not the worldview of the people at all. 
It was an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You hurt me, I hurt you back. So this is my argument here. For 2,000 years, we've heard this teaching of Jesus' show mercy, turn your swords into plowshares. And I would still argue 2,000 years later, we still don't really get this. Because you know what mercy means? Mercy means to give forgiveness to somebody even if they don't ask. Well, now we're meddling. Like, I can't give forgiveness if you don't ask. But we've defined forgiveness many times at Cornerstone as this, giving up the right to get revenge. Forgiveness is saying, God, I'm going to give them to you. And so Jesus is saying, clearly, you show mercy and you're going to elevate the world. The world is going to be a better place because of your kindness and your grace, even if they don't deserve it. You're basically saying, God, if they need punishment, bring punishment on them, but I'm not going to do it. I'm going to show them mercy. And I know this just can bring up so much rough emotion. And that's why this is a hard series of teachings. I love all the other teachings in the New Testament, and even the Old Testament. You can say, well, in that culture, and we have wiggle room, there's no wiggle room with Jesus. He like lays it out. You want mercy? Just show mercy. That's the good life. I'm like, oh, it doesn't feel good sometimes. I want them to be punished. It feels so much better. And so he's laying it out so, so harsh. But Jesus is saying when chains of injustice are broken in these moments and the guilty are forgiven, people are not seen as competitors, but fellow sojourners in life. I mean, this is a tough teaching. He goes on, we'll look at one more and then we'll bring it in for a, a big picture here. One more, the good life, he goes on, belongs to the pure in heart for they will see God. Shouldn't that be our goal? To see the face of God? I mean, wouldn't you think? I mean, that's why in Revelation it says that when we're in heaven, you know, we always talk about the jewels in your crown. I shouldn't tell you this, but anytime I try to guilt somebody into doing something, I'll say, oh, you'll get jewels in your crown. You know, it's kind of funny. I'm like, oh, I'll have a big, big jewels in my crown. The funny thing is, I shouldn't tell you this, but it's true. In Revelation, it says when we see the face of God, what do we do? We cast our crowns. We, we, it's like you say, everything I've ever tried to build up for my kingdom is but dust when seeing the face of God. He says, when you, the good life belongs to the pure in heart. Like when you're pure in heart, you will see God. I want that for us. That's, this is a hard one because it's literally getting to your motive. I can't, you, you all can snickerdoodle me. You can all lie to me. You can all fake it. I can fake it with you. But God knows when your heart is pure or not because we can put on the facade, but God knows the heart. And so you may ask, well, how, how, do, I, how do I get a pure heart? Well, Acts 15, we talked about this in our study on Acts a while ago. I'll bring it real quickly, then we'll bring it all together here. Acts 15, 8 and 9. God, who knows your heart, showed that he accepted us, them, by giving the Holy Spirit. So when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, he shows that we've been approved, righteous, right? Just as he did to us. So God accepted them. This is the Jews and the Gentiles. And he has done it for us. But this is beautiful. He did not discriminate between us and them. For God purified their hearts by faith. When we walk by faith, in all these teachings that we're going to do over the next 10 weeks, when we say, I'm going to, uh, this is hard to receive, Jesus, but I'm going to follow you. What, what Jesus is saying here is he's challenging us saying, when you walk by faith, I am going to fill you with all of these things. I will show you the keys to the good life. This is where it gets really good. I want to show you this list here. And this is going to compare what I started the sermon with, with where we're at right now. And if you bring, Seth, if you can bring the list up here. The good life, and what I have on the left side here is just generically speaking about the, U, the United States, how we see it in our culture. The good life would be, hey, if a person has good education, you're living the good life. You're wealthy, absolutely. You, you are comfortable, you can travel the world, you have successful children, 
early retirement. I mean, the list could go thousands of words. We could have tons and tons up here. These are just generically. Like, I bet every one of you would say, I would for certainly say this, if somebody had all of these, just this part, this short list, I would say, they're living a good life. Like, they, they're free, they're, they're, they can do what they want. Now, I want to be really clear. In no way is this bad innately. In fact, I pray that every one of you get to live this good life in the U.S. I, I hope this list comes to pass for you. I would love this kind of blessing on all of your lives. No question. But what I want to be really clear about today is this shouldn't be what we're striving for. These things should be a byproduct of living the good life according to Jesus. What you long for, what you dream about should be on, the, on this left side or right side as you're looking at it. <laughs> as you're looking at the right side, Jesus' list. I, I would really challenge you to, to think through have you ever, uh, like when I was a little kid, I remember looking at, you ever, when you were a kid, look up and you see all these puffy clouds. And this was before I got into a plane. And, and I, I would dream as a little, little kid, I'd be like, can I bounce on those? Like, wouldn't it be awesome to be able to bounce on the clouds? Like a big, big trampoline, the size of the sky. And I literally, my imagination at that time wasn't tainted by all of you saying, you can't do that. And I, was, I dream, these adults would say, no, you can't do that. And then eventually I'd go up in an airplane and I'd go through those clouds and realize it's just vapor. It's just a fog. And it causes turbulence. <laughs> it's not even fun to go through a cloud. <laughs> what in the world? But I want to make this really clear. I wonder if we've been duped by our culture. I don't even have to wonder, frankly. I know we have been duped. I would dare say we have been lied to, to follow the counterfeit way of life. It's, it's false. It's just a fog. If you got everything on that list in the US and then you add to that list of all the great things we could accomplish in this world, I promise you the one thing you will experience by the end of your life is it is but a vapor. Those things fade. Every one of those things fade. I have been with enough people who have attained what seems to be success according to the world. And they have still found themselves longing for satisfaction and peace in their soul. Uh, these things on that, that list, really, what they really are is going from maybe the next rush to the next, like the next big trip and the next big fun thing that we can do and the bigger house that we can get. You know what that all is? It's a dopamine fix. It's a quick rush in your body. Like you buy something new and don't you feel, oh, that felt good. That's just chemical reaction within your brain. But then that chemical dies down and you realize now I have to maintain this big house and I have to clean it. And it's like, it's exhausting. And what was once incredible, like I've arrived, I'm living the good life has become work and stress and anxiety because you put your energy into something that is not going to ultimately bring good living to your life. Oh, it'll be peaceful and it'll be some fun. You'll have a lot more laughter at times. Absolutely. Absolutely. But will it really last? Jesus is saying no. Put that list up one more time and we'll land here. Jesus says the good life is when you're poor in spirit and you admit I need a savior. When I mourn, when I am meek, when I crave righteousness, I just want to be approved by God, period. I just want to, I want to show mercy and be merciful. I want my heart to be pure. If I long for these things, Jesus says, your life will be a guaranteed success. And you will have peace that passes tremendous understanding. I think deep down you, even if you right now say, I can't do it. 
I can't do it. That, that is too extreme for me. That's why Jesus would talk to his disciples in the sermon. In fact, I almost wonder when he, this is just starting off his sermon, I almost wonder if right here he was saying to his disciples, the question I give for you today, do you still want to follow me? This is what his sermon is all about. For 10 weeks, we're going to be asked the question, as we look at the world get redefined, we're going to hear Jesus say, do you still want to follow me? And I want to show you the single worst verse in the Bible when it comes to following Jesus. And it's memorable. John 666. Right up here. Jesus did some hard teaching. And look at what it says. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Because Jesus calls us to live a redefined life that does not look like the things of earth. But I promise you, I promise you, if you long for the good life that we've just started talking about today and start pursuing it with your soul, I promise you, he will give it to you in abundance. The people that I've been most impacted by in life, frankly, are the ones who live the Jesus column. There's just something about them where I'm saying, when I'm with you, I just feel like I'm going to be okay. Why is that? Because I'm in the presence of somebody who is like Jesus with skin on, a disciple, a follower, who says, I'm all in, no matter what the cost. And so I may not see half of you here next week, <laughs> because this is hard. But I love what John Wesley said, give me 100 people on fire for Christ, truly on fire for Christ, and I'll change the world. Amen. So let's do this together. I'm going to invite the band to come out, and we're going we're gonna to sing and, and praise God. And this song is all about trust. Do I trust that God is going to give me the good life as I take this step of faith today? And this week, I challenge you for your homework assignment to read these Beatitudes. Beatitude means blessed to read these, these good life statements and ask yourself the question, am I, going, am I pursuing them? And if not, Lord, help me do that. Heavenly Father, I pray that we will have the courage during this series to really be disciples who are willing to really ask the tough question, do I wanna follow as I hear these, these tough statements of yours? And so Jesus, lead, guide, and direct us as you teach us by your Holy Spirit. I thank you, thank you, thank you for the good life that you're calling us to. And I thank you for redefining the areas we've been in error with our own lives. Correct us and take us to only where you can. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.